Severe Bowl, give it up for our South Knoxville campus, our Greensboro campus on this Sunday morning, everybody. What's going on? Let's celebrate all that God has done. If you have your Bibles today, I want you to turn to Deuteronomy chapter 6. Deuteronomy chapter 6. Please get something to write with. Grab a pen in the seat pocket in front of you. Please, please, please take some notes. If not, you're going to be like Scott Self, who just sang here at our Sevierville campus. I talked to him this morning before church, and he said, Brent, I was listening to a podcast, and this guy was talking about the Apostle Paul and this verse of Scripture, and he goes, it was amazing, and I looked at Scott, and I said, Scott, I just preached on that verse two weeks ago. (laughs) No, and he grabbed his notes, and he flipped to it, and he goes, oh yeah, you did. Even if you take some notes, sometimes you don't remember what I say, but the rule is what? 72 hours. If you don't take a note, you're not going to remember what I say. And today, you need to remember. We're in a series called Distracted. I don't want to embarrass anybody. I just want to see. I want to take a poll. We're going to do a lot of surveying of the crowd today. Don't want to embarrass you. So no one's feelings are hurt here. Ready? But I want to see this. We like to teach in series. This is the fifth week of this series called Distracted. We today are distracted as a society, as individuals, as families. We are so connected today with all of our technology, we are disconnected from each other more than ever before. So we've talked about about spending time alone with God. Hopefully you remember that. We talked about identity. We talked about technology. Last week, we talked about marriage. We had a bed on the stage and intimacy. Thank you for the email, by the way. I got so much good email. I got, look, I got zero bad email from last week, except the only person who had anything negative to say, and he was negative, was my son, who thought it was weird. (laughs) He came into the bedroom after I preached that first one, and he's like, I can't even look at my mom and dad. What is going on? So um, this week, we're going to talk about the family. We're going to talk about relationships and how we build those relationships. One simple, simple thing, simple thing that we can do, and it's going to go with the number five. We're going to talk about that in just a minute, but let's do this. If you've been here for five weeks now, you've been to every single um, message in this series, I want you to raise your hand. I just want to see, look around. Okay, put your hands down, not to make anybody feel bad, um, but maybe this is your first time. This is your first pass at this, this, this on the Distracted series. Raise your hand. Everybody's hands are all okay. Good. Um, watch the services back. This is such a good series. It's so needed because today, more than ever before, it's hard to define normal. It's hard to define normal. Let, let's see um, normal biblical literacy. Let's, let's, we'll, we'll do this. The book of Deuteronomy, is it in the New Testament or the Old Testament of the Bible? Oh. Greensboro? <laughs> South Knoxville? You guys are way above average, right? It, we're going to look at a passage of Scripture today, but, I, you know, it, it's kind of a normal thing that people don't know where the books of the Bible are and what the Bible has to say. And there's something so powerful about Scripture, especially when it comes to distracted, about building family relationships. So I'm going to go ahead and say it. If you are a parent and you have children at home, this message really is geared to you probably more than everybody else. But if you're single and you have a sphere of influence and you get to hang out with people and you want to build relationships, this message is for you. If you're a grandma and grandpa and you get grandkids on occasion, this message is for you. Um, Everybody, this message is for everybody, but really when it comes to families and parents, how do we impress, that's the word, impress upon our kids what it means to love God. For me as a pastor, I'll say it, today more than ever, it's, it's hard to define normal. I mean, it's tough. I'll say it like this, man. It's, it's tough to define normal. I, I got a story to tell you. You got to listen to the story. Don't get mad at me. But there was a visitor who visited a mental institution. He walked into the mental institution and he looked around and he found the director and he said this simple question. And he goes, sir, can you tell me what's the criteria that you use here for people to be institutionalized Wow, at this mental, turn your phone off there. We'll wait, we'll wait, we'll wait, no big deal. Is that boots? 
Speaking of mental institution, oh, that was good, Boots. That was perfect for you. All right, let's get back to the story because you got to get it. Ready? Visitor asked the director, what's the criteria in order to be institutionalized at this mental institution? The director goes, it's easy. We fill a bathtub and we give uh, the person a teaspoon, a teacup, and a bucket. And we ask the person to empty the bathtub. So the visitor goes, oh, I see. A normal person would take a bucket because the bucket is bigger and he would, she would empty the bathtub with the bucket, to which the director had this strange look on his face. And he goes, no. A normal person would pull the drain plug <laughs> To which the director said to the visitor, do you want your bed near a window? <laughs> oh, Boots, you killed my joke right there. No, anyway. Normal, it's harder than ever to define normal today. What is normal looking family health? Normalcy, things that we used to do versus things that we don't do anymore. And is it hurting us? Is it killing our relationships? Hence, the family table. Last week we had a bed on the stage. This week I bring a table on the stage. I've preached with a, a, a table on the stage before, but really never in this context. Typically I preach around a table and I talk about this. I think the church is like a table. We have to make more room at the table for people to come hear the gospel, to hear the, the bread of life and the, the living water. And I think today more than ever before, like when we invite somebody over to our house, we want to present a great atmosphere. We want to present a great meal. When you invite somebody over, you clean your house, you present your food in a creative, innovative way. And that's what I think about the church. I think sometimes the church, we take for granted that people are not coming to the table and we have to present the food in such a way that people will be engaged. But this week, I just want to talk about straight up the family table. I want to ask you a simple question. Do you eat meals around this table on a systematic, rhythmic, weekly basis? For years in our society, for thousands of years, God's going to show up, by the way, around the table. It's, I mean, to me, if you look in God's Word, He shows up so much around the table. It's amazing how much that happens. But today, it's interesting that many of us have abandoned the table. So Harvard has done a study, so you know it's not Christian, okay? Harvard did a study, and you can actually pull up the website called The Family Dinner Project. And in this series called Distracted, I wanted to spend one week on this idea of the family table. I want it to convict you because it's convicted me. I want it to challenge you because it's challenged me. We cannot abandon this table. How else are we to impress on the next generation the goodness and the love of God? See, for me, we're going to get to this in a minute. Deuteronomy 6 is basically going to say this. Jesus is going to reiterate this when a Pharisee tries to trap him. Hey, what is the greatest commandment? Deuteronomy 6 basically says this. We are to love God. I believe this is how the church should look like. We are to love God, love people, and celebrate the gospel. If you want to put church in simple terms, that's where I think we all need to live. Some people go, church should be this, it should be that, it should be deeper, we should do this, we should do that. No, we are to love God, love people, and celebrate the gospel. If we did that effectively, this campus, Greensboro, and South Knoxville, we would have 40 services a week, and we could not, fit, we could not still, we would need more room for people to come. We could not hold them all. If we were to love God love people, and celebrate the gospel. So let's take that to the house for just a minute. Let's take that to the home, husband, wives, especially parents with kids. How else do you impress and imprint on your children's lives that we are to love God, love people, and celebrate the gospel? When do you do that? Or are we all so distracted today, there is no time for any type of relationship, much less impressing on that next generation what matters 
the most. So this message is challenging to me. I just want to sit around the table. I want to, I'm just kind of think about a few things and I want you to see if you will agree with me, maybe be challenged. Harvard did this study called the Family Dinner Project. I read this a couple of months ago. It so intrigued me. I think, wow, this is amazing. You can kind of push the Bible away for a second. It's not just Christian 101 here. This is not just some Christianity thought, but listen to what Harvard discovered. Most of us probably know this, but we don't know it anymore. We've, we've lost it. We've abandoned it. The family table, why does it matter? What does it represent? So we'll start with the classic line we've been using for five weeks now. If we don't watch where we're going, we're going to end up where we don't want to be. Unless we are intentional today more than ever before, we are distracted. And listen to what it is. 20 years of study now. This is a two decade-old study that Harvard has done. And this is what they, sh- they have shown, that when we eat regularly around the table, listen to what's taking place. Especially when kids eat with their parents, they are more likely, listen to this, to have lower rates of obesity, to have higher self-esteem, a much more positive outlook on life, Just eating around the table lowers the rates of substance abuse, teen pregnancy, school behavioral problems, depression, anxiety, and suicide. Just eating around this table. Better body image, fewer eating disorders. Hey, parents, listen to this. Better grades, much better grades, like off the chart curving better grades, higher reading scores, and a much better vocabulary. I don't know, because you talk to each other? Sharing, how, how about this? Sharing a table is one of the most uniquely human being things we do. No other creature consumes its food at a table like humans do. I've never been in the woods. I don't know about you. Hunting season's coming up. Some of you hunters in this room, you can say amen. The rest of you can go, I can't believe you would do that. I've never been in the woods, ever, Doug, ever in the woods. One time where I saw a family of squirrels gather around a table. I never saw it. (laughs) Deer, do not gather around a table. We wish they did. Look, they're at a table. Pick the one you want. I mean, it doesn't happen. Only we do that. So it's not surprising, right? Think about this. We're going to kind of track through this and have some fun for a few minutes. It's not surprising that God's going to show up throughout Scripture, throughout, I mean, just time now. He's going to show up at a table. So write this down. The table is ultimately a big place of connection. Tables are the most important places of human togetherness. People have put it this way. You're never more fully alive than sharing a meal around a table with family and loved ones and friends. It's worth noting that the center of spiritual lives, God's people, both the Old Testament and the New Testament, we always find them at a table. We have the table of Passover, the table of communion. Next week to close this series, we're going to turn our eyes on Jesus again. We're going to take communion together, the table of communion. What was the table of Passover? Commemorating the biblical story of the Exodus, where God freed the Israelites from slavery in Egypt. We have all of this human connection, this divine connection around a table. So I wrote it this way, in a fast-paced, technologically saturated, attention deficit disordered culture, we need to recover the art of a meal around a table. So Matthew chapter 26, verse 26, before we jump into Deuteronomy, says this, while they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks... He broke the bread. He gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat. This is my body. The same pattern of language you're going to see throughout scripture. Blessing, breaking bread, giving. Jesus feeding the miraculous, uh, the the, the 5,000 miraculous feedings of Christ all the way to when the disciples discovered who Jesus was on the road to Emmaus. We find this over and over and over. The table is a place of connection. You're like, Brent, I know that. Okay, good. Let's keep going. The table is a place of blessing, blessing. Have you ever heard the thing called love languages? 
Typically, there's one or two ways that we can give and receive love. Who's ever read the book, The Five Love Languages, Love Languages? Um, I, I'll say this. I think food is one of my love languages. I, I like to cook. I'm not, that, I'm, not, I'm not that great of a cook. My wife is an Italian. She's a great cook. My mom is a great cook. My mom's mom was a great cook. My dad's mom, ah. <laughs> The only vividly, vivid thing I remember about my Nana, we would go over there and she would, we would have like eight of us around the table and she would scramble six eggs <laughs> and four pieces of bacon and three biscuits. It was an odd number. And I'm like, I'm looking at my dad. He's looking at me like, I'll take you to McDonald's after. I mean, that was... <laughs> But my grandmother, my, my mamma, my mom's mom, man, food was her love language. She would make, she was passionate about it. I loved going to her house. She made the best fried chicken in this deep dish, you know, just black skillet and macaroni and cheese. I mean, she made like Mount Everest of macaroni and cheese. And she made the best biscuits and sausage gravy. And I would break it and I would eat it and I would get halfway through it. She's like, Brent, here, get you a warm one. I'm like, Mamma, I love you. <laughs> and we had great times around the table. My mom will say, some of our best times, so will you as families. Some of our best times are around the table. My wife's family is Italian. What do you think we do? We sit down, bread hits us in 20 seconds. Because if you're an Italian and bread doesn't hit the table in 20 seconds, you're out of there, right? I mean, that's what's got to happen. We would break bread and we would have so much time together. I think about God's love language to me. I, I, I think about food as being God's love language to us. Why is it that he would give us 10,000 taste buds if that's not the case? I mean, food is an expression of God's grace and his love and his mercy to us. All the fat people say, amen. I mean, I love it. <laughs> Some people ask me, you know, like we've evolved. We, evolution, we've evolved. How have we evolved? If we, people say, well, we've evolved from apes. So we ask the question, why are there still apes, right? I mean, what is the, but here's the deal. If we were just like a product of evolution, how did we get 10,000 taste buds? Wouldn't that just be something that would just, I mean, we would just eat food for fuel, but isn't it, I mean, you're, some of you are like, Brent, I don't know what you're talking about. Like, food is God's love language. What? Let me give you a few shining examples. Outback cheese fries. <laughs> what if you didn't have taste buds? And a river of ranch dressing with it. That's going to be in heaven, right? You know that. There's going to be a literal liver, river of land, ranch dressing that you can whitewater raft in to the forest of cheese fries. I know that's coming. You think I'm crazy, but we, we lose sometimes so much. How about this? I mean, this looks good for lunch to me. A nice loaded potato and a steak. We'll wash this down with the next photo. Think of taste buds. The red velvet cheesecake from the Cheesecake Factory. All of these things are going to be in heaven, by the way, including dogs. <laughs> Cats, they're not going to be there. <laughs> so sorry. You're like, Brent, you've lost your mind. But a table is a place of blessing. Some of you are incredible cooks. What is it that you love to do? There's nothing better for you than to create a meal for your family or loved ones and watch them enjoy that meal and spend time together and then solve the world's problems. Talk about life. Talk about struggle. Talk about celebration. We've lost that. I'll tell you, I mean, just go to Applebee's. Some of you are like, I'm heading the Outback right after church today. I'm driving a long way for those cheese fries. Watch it in, in a restaurant today. I mean, we've abandoned this table. Some of you are like, is that what that is in the house? Is the, we're supposed to eat around that? We go to a restaurant. Nothing problem with going and wrong with going to a restaurant, although it's very difficult to hear and it's very difficult to communicate to each other and really dig in. But now we just all stare at our phones. We've lost any type of togetherness. How about this? This is awesome to think about this. The table is a place of blessing. There's an ancient prayer of the church. Actually, it's based on an even more ancient prayer, a Hebrew prayer. And it says this, blessed are you, O God, 
king of the universe, for you give us food to sustain our lives and make our hearts glad. Last week I said this, and I want to dig in for a little while. Who I'm committed to really determines who sets the rules. Who I'm committed to determines who sets the rules. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, you're going to find a verse of Scripture that's just such a powerful verse of Scripture. I want, you to, I want to read it, and then let's just unpack it, starting in verse 5. It says this, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. These commandments I give to you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home. And when you walk along the road, when you lie down, and when you get up, tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. What, I mean, that is putting that greatest commandment. You're like, what do you mean greatest commandment? In Matthew, if you want to turn to it, you can. If not, you can read it later. Matthew chapter 22, starting in verse 36, you're going to get a Pharisee. They're going to be really slick. They're going to try to trap Jesus. They're going to test Jesus, and they're going to ask Jesus a question. They're going to say, hey, Jesus, hey, what is the greatest commandment? And Jesus is going to reply by saying what? He's going to repeat what? Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment. And the second commandment is what? Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law, all the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. So parents... I'm convicted by this. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with your soul, and with your strength. These commandments I give to you today are to be on your hearts, okay? That means you are to put them and prioritize them in your life. Then what does it say very next? Impress them on your children. When do you do that? That is a perfect place. Kids love food. You're like, Brent, my wife don't cook well. We like to eat out. So think of the Harvard study. Let's go back to it. Ready? Check this out. 70% of meals today are consumed outside the home in a restaurant. 70%. 20%, they say, are consumed in the car. In the car. 60 60% of the people studied in this Harvard study, 60, say they never spend any type of regular time around a table in their home, ever. Shane Wilhoyt, some of you know Ellen and Shane. Shane was a school teacher. He was retired from Sevier County School System. He said at Sevierville Middle, they used to, um, a teacher used to gather students, and from time to time, they would sit around a table, and the teacher would talk to them, not in a study time, but just in a fellowship time at lunch. And he said, Brent, I would talk to 14 students. And he said, it blew me away. This is what he said to me um, last week at men's breakfast. It blew me away that every single time I did this, ten, we talked about, he says, we talked about the table. Do you spend time um, with, with family and relatives and mom and dad eating around the table? He would say 10 of the 14 students. Every time he did it, it would be different students. 10 of the 14 students never eat around their table, including holidays. Including holidays. Pastor Tim at our South Knoxville campus. Tim, I'll pick on you for just a minute. You and I had this conversation. When you got married to your wife, Pam, 30 years ago, that was one of the biggest fights because during a holiday or during a meal, Tim would grab his plate and he would go sit in front of the TV. And his new wife was like, what are you doing? We're going to eat at the table. And he goes, guess what we do now? We eat at the table. Some of you, listen, you're like, some of you are like, Brent, you're reading my mind. You're reading my email. I mean, we don't do that at all. I mean, come on. Are you telling me at Thanksgiving we're not going to watch football? I mean, are we going to sit around at a table and talk to each other? Do you know my in-law? Do you know my people? I've got a crazy aunt. It's weird. Weirder than boots. It's crazy. I mean, you're not going to. When do we impress 
on our sphere of influence, if you're single, what about your friends? And some of your friends do not know Christ. They are lost. They are disconnected. They are struggling to find togetherness. Moms and dads, especially if you've got kids at home, when do you impress on them, hey, we are to love God with our heart, soul, and, and strength? When do you do that? I'm just asking. We are distracted today. Kids today need it more than ever before. I need it today more than ever before. And God knows who I'm committed to is going to determine who sets the rules. And so this is what I've done. Listen to this. Here is the formula for success. We should know this, but let's make sure that we get this. Ready? The formula for success. Put God first in your family. I did a study. I referenced every verse that I could reference. I looked up the words commit, committed, commitment in Scripture. I studied it. Look up the word commit. Look up the word committed. Committed. You know what? I never found one time in Scripture that I'm to put my family first. It's not there. Not once. I'm to put God first, and I'm to impress that on my family. Jesus goes on to say what? He'll say this verse of Scripture. He says this, Anyone who loves his father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves his son or daughter, ah, what? More than me is not worthy of me. God knows who I'm committed to is going to determine who sets the rules. Repeat it after me. God knows who I'm committed to will determine who sets the rules. So number one, here's what you got to realize. What are we going to talk about around the table? If I'm committed to my family first, then if my family is not happy, I won't obey God. If, we put my fa- if I put my family first, you put your family first, it happens all the time. If they're not happy, I won't obey God. You're like, Brent, I don't know exactly what you're talking about. Flesh that out. Okay, let's go. My son today, who was at church on Wednesday night, he's in Johnson City right now playing baseball. Right now, 9 o'clock in the morning, he's playing at Cardinal Park. That's the minor league park of whatever team. 9 o'clock. Do you think the team that he's on, he's playing a few weeks here in the fall, cared about church this morning at 9.30? No, they didn't. They said, parents? This is when we're playing, 9 o'clock. So my son was here Wednesday night, got the message, actually came up here and sat with me for a while. And why would I say that? How many people today put family first, making sure Junior, Johnny, and Susie are happy, and they don't obey God? I know so many, I'm embarrassed to say how many people I know that spend seasons, months out of this building. Their kids are not in church at all because they're playing a travel sport because that's going to make them happy. That really probably doesn't make the kids happy as much as the parents. We got to keep up with the Joneses. We got to make sure our kid's a little bit better than that kid. When the truth were told and I, my son was right here, I set him here and I stood behind him and I said this, Mason's a good little high school baseball player. Chances are very low that he's going to play college ball. There are probably better a chance for him to get struck by lightning than play pro ball. But yet we put in hours and hours and hours and hours. Why? Because this is what makes us happy. This is what makes our kids happy. I'm just saying, if we put God first, do you realize realize the implications that it's happening? We forgo meals. We forgo family time. We forgo time together. And there's nothing wrong with travel sports, but it's got to be in the right context. It's got to have a balance. There's got to be a balance. When do we? I mean, mom and dad, I'm the worst, okay? I want my kid to hit a ball. I'll throw him a thousand baseballs. I've done it year after year, month after month, week after week since he's seven years old. How much do we really impress? Hey, Mason, love God with all your heart, with your soul, and your strength because the chips are going to be down one day. Your life is not going to go the way you thought it would go one day. You're going to struggle. You are going to feel disconnected. You're going to feel the weight of comparison. You're not going to be good enough. Somebody's always going to be better. If you don't have that relationship with God, man, you are going to struggle. When do we impress that on our kids? I mean, I've got horrible stories to tell. I've got stories where I I remember vividly, I can't believe this would have happened, but it happens all the time. We'll call in little Johnny. He was in Kids 22-6. He was unruly that day. Um, One of the teachers had to talk to a parent after church was out. Hey, little Johnny hit somebody. It was a little bit of an issue. Do you think the parent who would have said, okay, I'll talk to little Johnny. Thank you for letting me know what happened. The parent got defensive, blamed Kids 22-6, blamed our teacher. Um, John Johnny can do no wrong. They left the church, never came back to church. They actually left church, and a year 
Almost to the day later, they got divorced. Their marriage is over, their family is apart. If we don't put God first, and we put family first, if we put family first and our kids aren't happy, we don't obey God. Do you really think that benefits you and your kids? Just ask, and you're like, ooh, it's hard. By the way, how was that ball game last night? No, I, I thought it was good. Georgia beat Notre Dame. I, I mean, that was... Did Tennessee play? Because I know my Tar Heels didn't. They got beat by Appalachian State. Tennessee. Tennessee might need to start putting God first. Anyway. Um, I'm digressing now, Robbie. Number two, if, if I commit to my family first, then I'll do what I, rather than God, think is right goes right along with it. I could talk more about stuff, but I'll, I'll, let's throw one thing in there to close. One thing. Let's do this. Let's take a survey as, as a church at all of our locations. How many think it's just completely inappropriate, inappropriate for a 12-year-old to play an M-rated video game, mature-rated video game, 17 and older, I don't know, games like Call of Duty and Grand Theft Auto. Does anybody in this room think it's really inappropriate for a 12 to 13 year old boy to play those games? Raise your hand high. Look around. Oh, we're, we're all, the five steps of change is coming to life right here. We value that. How many students do you think 12 to 14 year old boys play Call of Duty and Grand Theft Auto? Okay, here's my question. Just, just the preacher meddling. If my 12-year-old boy goes to GameStop, can he buy the Call of Duty game or Grand Theft Auto game on his own? No. Who bought the game for him? You did. If we put family first, we, rather than God, will do what we think is right. Why do we do that? I'm going to give you a word. It's called social conformity. Social conformity, here's the definition. It'll come on the screen. A type of social influence involving a change in belief or behavior in order to fit in with a group of people. My son sat on this stage a few nights ago. I brought him up here for a reason, for accountability. I said, Mason, you, when you were 12 years old, you begged mom and I for Call of Duty. Begged us. When did you actually get that game? 15, he said. I gave in. I'm the one that gave in. His mama would have held her ground, but I gave in. Why? Social conformity. You're like, well, Brent, that's good. 15 is okay. It's still 15, a little under 17, right? He couldn't have walked in and bought it, and now he justified Mason. Man, he sat there. He wore me down. He's like, Dad, Call of Duty. It's a World War II game. I mean, come on. I'll be an American. I'll fight the Germans. God bless them. I mean, he was wearing me down. But it's a game that, what, shoots people over and over and over. And you know what he did? Hey, Dad, every, every friend has this game. Everybody has this. Every, everybody has this game. My son-in-law, who's at South Knoxville this morning, he took Mason down the dark side. He's older than Mason. He plays that game. Mason would come to me, Dad, Houston, my brother-in-law, who I would like to get closer to, is playing that game, and he could put that little thing in his ear, and we can talk and build togetherness, and we can, we can be the Americans together. I mean, he wore me down. And my wife, I mean, I vividly remember the argument we got into. She's like, Brent, he shouldn't have that game. That's M-rated. That's 17. But I gave in, even I, because why? Social conformity. And sometimes we have to go back to it. And I wanted him to hear. I apologize. I wanted him to hear that. Now, my son, I'm, I'm grateful. He's kind of a throwback kid. He hasn't touched a PlayStation game in three months. And that's amazing. I'm not told him he can or can't. He's almost 17 now. It's fine. But he likes to do other things. He's into sports. He gets ready to hunt. People get mad at me. They're like, I can't believe you're, you allow your son to hunt. I don't know. Go outside in nature. I mean, it's crazy. That, I've had parents scream at me and yell at me. That's horrible when their 14-year-old sits six hours a day playing Grand Theft Auto. We've gotten distracted. We have forgotten so many things, so many truths. 
And so my son, as he sat here the other day, and I'll do this, I'll think about this. Um, I'll sit in this center seat, and I want you to imagine um, your family in these seats. I'll put my wife here, my son here, my daughter here, my son-in-law here. You put your family in these seats. And here's what I'll say. Um, I, I like this phrase, um, if it's within my power, we'll put it this way, if it's within our power, as moms and dads, grandmas and grandpas, you'll track with me here, you're going to do whatever you can do to make their lives better than your life. Yes? We want to give our kids, our grandkids, everything that we can possibly give them. We want to give them um, a great foundation. We want to give them access to the best educational opportunities, the best um, health care that we can um, afford, and that's a big issue in our world today. We want, to, we want to make sure life is good for them if it's with our own power. And we do that day after day, season after season. We do our best. We as parents, especially in sports, will pay money for a kid's instructor. We'll put them on the best teams. We'll travel around to try to get them the most competition that they can. If it's within our power, we'll do it. But the problem with that is that's what they learn as they get older. So now it's everything about within me, my own power, what I can do. And then they start feeling the weight of comparisons. Life begins to hit them. They're going to find out they're, they're, they're they're not as special as maybe mom and dad told them they were. And the boss is difficult and relationships are hard. There's a story of a little boy who was trying his best to pick up this large boulder. His dad was standing just with an eyesight. The little boy was try ah, ah, trying his best. The dad says to the little boy, are you giving it all you got? strength. Are you trying to lift up that rope? Yeah, Dad, I am. I'm doing it. The dad goes, no, you're not. Yes, I am. No, you're not. Yes, I am. To which the dad goes, what? No, you're not, son, because you haven't asked your dad to help you. Deuteronomy chapter 6 simply is a prayer of saying, hey, God, you know what? We have to ask you for help in our one and only life. We impress upon our children, hey, no matter if you've blown it in life, no matter if, you know what, your kids have seen far too much, that's when you go, hey, God's mercies are new every morning. I want you to know that, you know what, life has changed. His grace and mercy has made me a new person. I, I've made mistakes. I've walked the wrong paths, but I want to be intentional, and I want to walk down a road that God wants me to walk down in this one and only life, and I want to put God first, and guys, when I put God first, my family begins to benefit in so many ways. Why? Because it will teach them to start putting God first. So my question to all of us, when do we impress that truth on our kids who need it? How bad do they need it? With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, just want to close this message. We're going to go into a song that I love. I want every parent in this room, I want you to think of the number five. The Harvard study will say this. They know it's impossible today to sit down as a family, breakfast, lunch, and dinner every day. It's impossible. So they threw out a guideline. They threw out a challenge, and I'm going to throw out the same challenge. I'm actually going to drop it just a little bit to make it attainable. How about this? Think of the, the number five. Everybody, parent in this room, five. What if we walk out of church right now and we put into our calendars and our lifestyles that we are going to take five meals a week and we're going to be as intentional as we can be with five meals a week. We're going to put our phones down and we are going to talk in those five meals a week, yes, about our lives, about our struggles, about our celebrations, about our schoolwork, all those things. But we're going to be intentional about celebrating the love of God in our lives. We're going to be intentional about celebrating the blessing that God brings to us in our lives. We're going to pray to start the meal. 
We're going to impress on our children some things that maybe we should talk about, truths, read scripture. We're going to spend a few minutes before we break bread together. We're going to give God thanks. What if, parent, what if you did that? Five meals. Pick five. Five meals a week. That would be what? Two and a half, three hours, maybe up to five hours a week that you have an opportunity to impress on your kids. Some of you are like, my kids don't want to eat at home. They don't like home cooking. It's all Chick-fil-A. Okay, Chick-fil-A is Christian. Do this, mom and dad. Hey, how about this? Go through Chick-fil-A's drive through Get a feast and bring it home. What? Bring it home? Do waffle fries, will they last all the way to the house? Bring the food home, spread it out at your table, put the phones away, and eat Chick-fil-A and talk about the blessings of God. This message cannot live here in this building. It can't live in Greensboro. It can't live in South Knoxville's campus alone. This has got to be taken outside these walls. Five meals, all of us, in our world of influence. What if we was to spend time, husbands and wives, five meals, talking about the blessings of God? Deuteronomy 6, love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your strength. Do we have to be like everybody else? Do we have to conform like everybody else conforms? The firm principle of Christian life is what? We put God first. If we put our family first, then God will be second, if not further on down the list. How will that benefit our children when times are tough, the chips are down, life is not the way they intended it to be, but God loves them, he can be with them, and they can love him. I'm telling you now, that's a benefit that I need to put back into my life more than ever, be more intentional than ever. If not, it's easy to get distracted. God, be with us as a church as we leave here, but most importantly, as we stop for a few moments and just sing uh, some words to an incredible song that goes so much to the heart of the message. You are an everlasting God. No matter the trends that change today, you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. Be with us, guide us, allow us to be smart enough to put these truths into our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people at every location said. Would you stand up, church? Don't leave. Sing this with Jeanette. She's going to lead us. Let's just lift this up. I love this song. We're all around the table now. Let's sing it together. Come on. The Lord is my light and salvation. Shall I feel? Whom shall I be afraid? The Lord is my light and salvation. Whom shall I feel? Whom shall I be afraid? I will wait for you. I will wait for you. 
message has been sponsored by Outback Steakhouse Cheese Fries. Give somebody a high five. Love you guys. See you next week.